good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final um, webinar in this series by PETA, which um, helps teachers to explore the CBCA shortlist for 2012. Um, we've got loads to get through today. Um, we're going to be covering pretty much all of the texts that are um, in four of the categories from the shortlist. So I'm going to be going um, fairly fast. Um, before we start, though, there's um, a couple of things I'd like you to, um, to do to, to get used to the format that we're going to be using. So um, in a minute, you'll see a little box pop up on your screen. And this is um, a web poll. And there'll be a couple of web polls through the presentation. So once the bo box pops up on your screen, can you please just say yes or no? And whilst you're doing that, hi, I'm Sophie. And um, I'll be, obviously, your presenter um, this afternoon. I'm an assistant principal at a school in, um, in Sydney in the Lower North Shore, and I'm actually on maternity leave at the moment. So, and I've been lucky enough to um, author and co-author Peter's um, guide to the CBCA shortlist for the last three years. So, um, and it's lovely to be able to actually um, share my enthusiasm for children's literature with you this afternoon. So, a few people answering now. Let's have a look. So, looks like most. Sorry, I'm just having a look at my other screen there. Looks like. More people haven't participated than have, so welcome for those of you who have participated before. Sorry if uh, this bit's a bit um, repetitive for you, but it's just good for people to get used to the format. Okay, that's pretty much all the answers in. So it looks like most of you haven't, so um, I'll just go through something else. Um, if you have a look at the top of your screen, just underneath the address bar, you'll see a little... Um, little word called feedback with a, a hand. This is a way that you can um, give me feedback throughout the presentation using emotions. I can see Holly's already got a bit of a grin down there, so thank you, Holly. If you have a look in the feedback section and click on there, you'll be able to, if you can raise your hand, I'll be able to see that you're kind of giving me a wave, so it's a bit of, a, bit of an e-wave there. Well done, Amanda. Thank you, guys. Fantastic. And you can, um, at any point during the presentation, you can tell me to go faster or slower, or if there's something you like, let me know. If there's something you don't like, you can give me a sad face. So, okay. All right. And finally, um, it's just nice for us all to um, know who, who's sharing in, in the webinar and where you're from. So if you can, um, in the message box at the bottom right hand of the screen, can you please type what year you teach, or if you're a whole uh, whole school attending, just write whole school, um, and obviously a librarian as well, write librarian, and um, what state you're from, and that will give me a bit of an idea of, um, of our national makeup today. I can see that um, Singapore, fantastic, that's exciting. Wow, that really is international. Teacher librarians, student teachers, fantastic. Okay, so quite a, I've got a school from the Gold Coast, welcome guys. Year 6, New South Wales. Good, so there's quite a range. And I saw that someone, is it Bernadette, had given us a weather forecast from Darwin. So lovely, 27 degrees. You're very lucky. It's certainly not 27 degrees in Sydney, I can tell you that. All right. We might move on with the presentation. Um, and by the way, if you do have any comments or questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to write them in the message box, and I'll try and get to them as we, um, as we move through the presentation. All right, so the outline of today. Um, we're going to very briefly look at the Australian Curriculum English, because not everyone um, is necessarily familiar with it, and all the states are at different stages of implementation. I'm going to take you through um, Peter's digital units of work online, which you can access, and I'm just going to take you through the format and how you can get hold of those. And then we're going to get into the CBCA shortlist. I'll take you through the four categories that I'll be covering. And then um, we're going to look at some of the text from the perspective of themes, so you can program in a cross-curricular perspective. And then we're going to be looking at um, some of the literacy of the text. We're going to look at four texts in detail. And there's also going to be a bit of an, an activity for you to do um, based on one text. So it's going to be a busy hour and a half. All right. So um, let's have a web poll. Let's see how you guys um, are going with the Australian Curriculum English. I know that um, different states are in very different stages of implementation. Sorry if um, you have already attended the Picture Books webinar and I've already asked you this question, but it, it was gives very interesting um, responses. So are you currently using the curriculum to plan, teach, and assess? 
Are you just having training in it through your school? Have you just read it independently or you're not familiar with it? So if you can please click your answer and, and respond, I'll have a look at um, people's level of familiarity. Ah, interesting. So looks like most people um, have only just read the Australian curriculum or aren't familiar with it at all, which is quite interesting because the demographic in, in the last lot of webinars, there were some quite a few people who were quite familiar with it, and that's obviously dependent on state. I know New South Wales is um, developing their own um, <laughs> developing their own response to the Australian curriculum, so we're a little bit a little bit behind in New South Wales. So interestingly, it looks like about 50, 60 percent of people aren't familiar with it at all. Okay, so I'm going to take you through really, really quickly, um, just the broad outline of the curriculum. And then I'm going to explain how the Australian curriculum has been mapped onto the units of work, Peter's digital units of work, so that you will be able to make connections between the way that you're currently programming and teaching um, with your state curricula um, sort of transitioning across to that Australian curriculum. So, of course, the Australian curriculum English um, has three main strands, language, literature, and literacy. And, of course, the four modes which are interwoven across the strands of writing, speaking, reading, and listening, as um, you can see here in a little diagram. Um, now, of course, in these three strands, there are a number of substrands as well. So, what we have done in Peter's Digital Units of Work is set up a model um, which kind of joins some of the substrands together so that, um, oh, I guess, under, under headings or titles. So will they, they, they'll they still have a message box, though, won't they? Mm, yeah, I have. I'm, come on. Yeah. I'm on. Okay, I'm great. On. I just can't see you. Oh, oh fantastic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'll keep going. Sorry about that, guys. Slight technical problem. Okay, so um, the next section that you will see in um, Peter's Digital Units of Work, audio back but no video. Okay, well, I, I might just keep talking and I'm sure the video will pop in in a minute, um, is responding to literature. Hi everyone, sorry about that. Um, so looking at responding to literature, at the top here, that directly maps across to the substrand in literature. Um, in examining literature, again, is a direct map down to the substrand in the Australian curriculum there. Um, and finally, and, and by the way, responding to literature is really about students developing their own points of view, um, values and attitudes towards literature, um, obviously backing them up with references to text. Examining literature is um, more about going into um, plot, character and setting, for example. And then, of course, creating literature, that links into both literacy and literature, and that's where the students both um, tackle the conceptual challenge of creating a text and also the um, mechanical challenge. So you're looking at um, how and why they're creating text, but also um, the, the techniques that, that they are using. Okay, so moving on just to the bottom here, there are um, three sections in, in language um, that I've divided it into. And I kind of, um, when we actually developed the units of work, we thought about text level and sentence level and word level. So, um, and those are sort of quite familiar terms, I think, for some, um, for some teachers. So at text level, um, really you're mapping um, two of, I might change color here so you can see, you're mapping two strands, two substrands, interpreting, analyzing, evaluating, and text structure and organization. And this is where you're looking at the overall structure and cohesion of a text, and um, also the organization of, of a whole text. And then at sentence and word levels, um, that kind of splits into two from the language strand. And um, interestingly, in the Australian curriculum, there um, is a facility to look at um, visual and multimodal features. And of course, that was um, a really heavy emphasis of the last webinar. If you didn't see the last webinar, you will be able to access it um, through Peter's website in, in the near future. OK, I know that that was um, quite confusing, but hopefully it will all become clear when we um, switch to the website. So well, I'm going to take you to um, the Peter website where the digital units of work are hosted and show you how that little curriculum map actually um, maps onto the digital units of work. Okay, so we're just going to switch over now. Okay, so um, on your screen you'll see this is um, this is Peter's um, what well, is the, the CBCA section 
of um, Peter's website. And at the moment, there are um, a number of digital units of work available for free um, to, to anyone who um, comes to the website. And then all of the other digital work, um, all of the other, oh, excuse me, all of the other digital units um, are available to Peter members. Or as you can see, there's a button where you can purchase online access. You can see I'm, I'm highlighting that with my mouse. So I'll just take you through um, one of the um, samples. We'll have a look at flood. And so as you can see, um, those substrands that I talked about with the organization are, um, are here in the tabs at the top that I'm showing you with my mouse. So covering literature and literacy, you've got the context of literature and examining literature, and you've got a number of activities that map um, into those, and of course also responding to literature. And then when you go to the next tab, you've got creating literature, and for this one, because it's a picture book, you've got examining visual and multimodal features. And then finally, in the language section, you've got examining text structure and cohesion and the activities that go with that, and examining gra grammar and vocabulary. So hopefully what you will see is that this essentially replicates um, the way teachers are teaching at the moment, but also maps the Australian curriculum onto it. So it should be a nice bridge for those of you who are starting to use the curriculum. Um, and a few more features I just want to take you through. As you can see, um, when I move my um, mouse over these ACELY um, numbers, these are hyperlinked to the content descriptors in um, on the Australian Curriculum website. And also there are other hyperlinks to useful resources that you can use in teaching the activities. There's some good additional resources at the bottom that will help you um, help you get, uh, I guess, some, some background understanding. And also um, for some of the texts, there are publisher's notes as well, which can be really, really useful if you want to go into the text in further detail than we have done in this treatment. And um, on the left over here, of course, you've got um, a link to the author, author's website and the illustrator, and a brief synopsis, and then, of course, the themes and the age um, suitability. So these, access, these um, units, like I said, are available um, through the PETA website to help you with your teaching in the classroom. If you're a PETA member, um, you'll be able to um, access them already. And if you're not, you can access the sample units and then pay for the other units as you go. All right, we'll switch back to the presentation now. Sorry about this, just scrolling through. Okay, so we're going to get into the shortlist now. That was, I know, quite a quick introduction. Um, we've got a lot to cover. So what I'll do um, is I will take you through four of the categories and give you a brief overview of the books. Um, we'll talk about some of the cross-curricular themes that can be extracted from, um, from the current um, Australian curricula and kind of how they might map onto state, curricula, uh, state syllabi. And then also we'll talk about some of the literature and, and literacy themes that, that run through this year's text. And then, um, like I say, we'll go into some of the themes in, in detail, and I'll be showing you um, images from some of the texts, and then we'll look at four texts in detail as well. Okay, so, um, fantastic thing about the shortlist is, of course, it's quality literature which has already been selected for you. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I know that teaching is an incredibly busy um, profession, and we rarely have time to do the research to find um, to find brilliant new texts that you can teach within the classroom. And the great thing about the um, CBCA shortlist is they're already selected. So of course there are the five categories: older readers, younger readers, early childhood picture books, and information books. Now, just to let you know, we're not actually going to be looking at the older readers um, section today because this is really focused on um, the F to six or K to six classroom. Most of the older readers books are really aimed at a secondary level. Um, some can be used for um, older upper primary students, so you know, mature year five, some year sixes. Um, but today we're just going to be looking at the four categories of the younger readers, early childhood picture books and information books. Okay, so in the younger readers section, um, we've first of all got Crow Country by Kate Constable. And this, this text is um, it's a combination of um, a mystery novel and a historical novel and a time slip. So it's set up in a way that um, the character, well, without spoiling the book, um, the character um, essentially engages with um, an indigenous dreaming figure, um, Wa the Crow, 
and um, find out about a murder and a, a mystery and something um, that happened in the past. And in order to solve this, this, this murder and this mystery, she actually um, slips back in time, um, back to the 1930s when this murder took place. So the story is, is about um, the girl's experiences in modern-day rural Australia. It's also about her experiences back in um, the 30s in rural Australia. And it also interweaves some um, fantastic indigenous themes. I'll be talking about that um, later. Okay, Verity Sparks is, again, a mystery novel. And this one is set in um, Victorian Britain. And it's a fantastic text to explore issues of, of class whilst looking in the context of, um, you know, I guess, the Victorian culture that probably influenced early Australian um, settlement. It's a mystery in the sense that the girl has special powers and she can find lost things. So, and again, we'll be looking at some of the themes throughout through all of these books in a minute. Bungawitta is a story of a very small rural town which is unfortunately suffering from terrible drought, um, quite topical, obviously, um, over the last few years. And what happens is the town decides that in order to save themselves, they need to get some tourists. And so they put on the Bungawitta Sculpture, Earth Sculpture Festival. And they set up this wonderful festival and they, all these tourists come, and then, of course, right in the middle of, uh, right in the middle of their festival, the drought uh, breaks in a rather spectacular fashion. Brother Band, the Outcast. Um, for those of you who know the Sorcerer's Apprentice, um, this is by the same author, so the, Sorcer the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice um, series. And um, Brother Band is the first in what is going to be a number of, of, of texts. It's set in a mythical Viking era, and it's a brother band is essentially um, a crew of, of young men who have to bond together um, to sail a Viking, a Viking ship. And as well as the crew of the ship, they are also warriors, and they have a very special place in, in Viking culture. It's a fantastic text to explore um, concepts of identity and coming of age, and a really, really great text. Um, to get boys interested in literacy. Um, there's some excellent war themes and um, some, some really good blood and gut stuff, um, but also some really inspiring ideas about leadership and individuality. Um, Emily Rudder, The Golden Door. This is, again, the first in um, what will be a series, and it's a purely fantasy novel um, set in, obviously, a, a, fantasy, um, a fantasy world. Interestingly, it's set in a world that's very, very narrow, and the characters don't quite realize that they are trapped in this city of, of the world, but they don't really realize there's a world out there. And what happens is um, all of the men disappear from, well, the men and boys disappear from this city to try and combat these um, dragons that are um, essentially killing the population of the city every single night. And they all disappear, and a young boy um, takes on the task to go and see what's happened. And of course, he goes through the Golden Door and he discovers this whole other world out there and he has to use magical and mystical um, objects which have been given to him. He's essentially a chosen one to, um, to try and save his, his brothers and these other people. And finally, Nanbury, I'm going to be featuring um, as one of the texts later on in the presentation, so I won't talk about that too much. Um, it's set right at the beginning of, um, of the Australian colony, um, so when the first um, fleet arrives. And it's a story of, of a young um, Aboriginal boy who gets adopted by one of the first surgeons here um, in, in New South Wales. And it's a story written from a, a number of different perspectives. OK, moving on to the next category, picture books. For those of you who um, have already seen the picture books webinar, you'll, you'll be quite familiar with these. Um, actually, can I just have a quick um, quick message? Has anyone actually attended the Picture Books webinar as well, just so I can see who we've got here and, and how long I should talk on this topic? So if you did attend the Picture Book webinar, can you just type yes? So no, Bernadette, yes, thank you. Oh, yes, I remember you, Marty. Okay, so generally no. So sorry if it's a yes, but I'll go through this quickly. Um, all right, so Dream with a Thylacine, 
amazing book, absolutely brilliant. Um, Margaret Wilde and Ron Brooks, who wrote Fox. Tomb of the Thylacine is um, a wonderful visual text that is uh, accompanied by some quite poetic language um, that essentially is a cross between an ode and a lament um, for, of course, the extinct um, Tasmanian tiger, the Thylacine. It's beautifully set out, very stunning visually, very rich text. Um, and again, I analysed that in, in the last picture book session, so I won't talk too much about that because, again, you can access that if you would like to in the future through the PETA website. Um, no Bears, we're going to be looking at later today. No Bears is actually um, actually nominating two categories in picture books and early childhood, so we'll be looking at that in a minute. And it's about a little girl who wants to write a book, and the most important thing about her story is that there are no bears in it because she doesn't like bears. So we'll go through that in a minute. Four All Creatures is um, a lovely extended poem that really reminds me a little bit of, um, of the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, of all things. And there are some great double-page spreads which have little kind of um, poetic quartets which, which are odes to spiders and caterpillars turning into butterflies. And it basically covers a whole range of, of creatures and um, great, great, great links if you're teaching younger children um, some of the meta language to do with with, um, with animals and also looking at the environment. It's got some really lovely, um, lovely illustrations as well. Okay, Flood down here at the bottom by Jackie French. This, this book was actually written in response to the Queensland, the terrible Queensland floods that happened um, just every, well, a year and a half ago now. And... Um, it talks about, essentially, it, it recounts and narrates the story of the flood, but really focuses on the way um, the community, both locally, nationally, and internationally, kind of came together to um, to help the, the, the flood victims and, and to rebuild the flood-affected areas. Um, again, a very, very lyrically written book with some, some clever illustrations where um, it almost looks like the... It's, it's, it's done in a watercolour, so each page almost looks like it's been saturated by the flood. So again, there's, um, there's quite a lot to, to study in there from the perspective of, of environment and community. A Bus Called Heaven, um, I will be looking at this one later. This is the latest offering by Bob Graham. And it's about an abandoned bus which is turned into a community centre. So we'll be studying that um, later on in the presentation. And Look a Book is a really, really interesting text by Libby Gleason and Freya Blackwood. Um, very, very, very visual text. Just... Um, very limited um, narration, and the story really is in the images and, and creating that gap between the images and the words. So it's brilliant as a multimodal as a multimodal text, and it's about two children from a fairly impoverished background who find a book, and the book enables them to um, go to all these amazing imaginary places, which turns the humdrum world around them into this. Um, exciting and new and amazing world and the best thing about it is because it's a book you can pick it up and read it again and again and again and free your free yourself from your surroundings through your imagination um, it's, it's a really really lovely little book okay the next category early childhood so obviously no bears is also featured in early childhood so we won't talk about that one again come down cat is Little boy this conference and is now and they in conversation mode. Fears. Nicholas is afraid of the dark. This conference is now in, the in presentation the mode. Like rain. And um, what happens one day is the cat um, stays on the roof and won't come down. And Nicholas is really worried because he thinks the cat's going to be attacked at night. Um, and he imagines all these horrible things happening to the cat. He's lying in his bed all frightened. And... The cat is sitting up on, on the roof having a final time, but then suddenly, of course, the rainstorm comes in and the cat's terrified. And Nicholas has to overcome his fears to rescue the cat. So it's a lovely story about, um, I guess, about, about relationships and about overcoming your fears and identity. And it's really lovely um, for kindergarten and year one, especially when you're talking about um, those concepts about me and myself and, and my identity. That's not a daffodil um, over here is an interesting sort of hybrid text. It's, it's a story about a little boy um, and his neighbor who helps him to grow a daffodil. 
but it also operates essentially as an explanatory text in terms of how a daffodil grows and what you need to do to care for living things. Um, each time that Tom looks at the daffodil, he doesn't think it's a daffodil because, first of all, it's a desert. There's nothing there. It's just a pot with dirt, and then he makes it rain in the desert, and um, slowly little green little green spikes come up, and then it's a green finger, and then it's a rocket ship, and finally, you know, it's a lamp, and finally it's a beautiful golden trumpet. So the story kind of charts the development of of the or um, well, the growth of the daffodil and what Tom has to do to to take care of it. And it's another interesting example of of, of a hybrid text. Rudy Nudie is about children's bath time. So you've got Rudy Nudie and her sibling, and they are having a fine old time in the bath, fishing, splashing around, and they get out the bath and run around the house. Um, Nudie, obviously. So, um, and I'll say this, as I said in the, in the last webinar, um, obviously you need to think about um, the cultural background of your students um, with this text, because for some it might not be appropriate. Um, it's set as a poem and it's got a really strong rhythmic sense though and the actual language is, the literacy demands of the language are, are quite low. So um, it's a nice little introductory text to do with kindergarten especially. Okay, The Runaway Hug is a story about a little girl, Lucy, who gets a hug from her mum and it's her last hug there. And she shares the hug around and the hug travels all the way around the family she gives the hug to someone else who gives it to someone else and the hug comes back as a peanut buttery kiss from the baby and a lick from the dog and eventually it comes all the way back to Lucy as she goes to bed. And this text is a really nice introduction to the theme of family and concepts of family. Um, you know, who's in your family? How do you relate to each other? Um, it's just a, one of those texts that leaves you with a warm glow. And finally, the last Viking is about a little boy, Josh, who... Um, isn't afraid of anything apart from monsters and Vikings and pretty much anything you can you can name. He kind of thinks he's brave, but he's not. Um, he's also getting terribly bullied by some horrible children, and um, he decides he's going to become a Viking. And the real Vikings up in Valhalla get quite excited by this and watch his progress very very carefully. And um, I'm not necessarily impressed with with his his performance as a as a, as a Valhalla warrior. And um, they step in at the last minute when he's facing another one of these bullying situations. And um, unbeknownst to Josh, they intimidate the bullies. And so Josh thinks he's actually beaten the bullies and that builds his confidence and enables him to be a successful big brother, which is, of course, the important role that he's stepping into as he's growing up. Okay. And finally, the information books category. Um, really broad range in the information book this year. The Little Refugee is by the comedian Ando. You might know him for his um, biography, The Happiest Refugee. Um, the Little Refugee is written specifically for children, and it charts his, um, his journey from Vietnam. He was um, a refugee from the Vietnam War, one of the original boat people, and it talks about his, um, the reasons that he left Vietnam, his journey and also his um, his arrival and, and welcome into Australia and how he assimilated into the culture and um, you know what what it was like for him to experience um, a completely different culture as someone who didn't speak the language and um, there's some great um, great 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 connections there for, for obviously for refugees and, and migration themes and sense and themes of belonging. Bilby Secrets. We are going to have a look at this one a bit later on. It is essentially an information book about a bilby, but it's a really interesting hybrid text. So it's both an information book and a recount strict narrative, and we'll have a look at that um, later. One Small Island is the story of Macquarie Island, um, and essentially it charts, it starts off with a geographical introduction as to where Macquarie Island is and what it is. And then it goes into the history of the island. Um, it's got an incredibly rich and interesting history. It was used by early whalers and sealers um, as both a, a camp and a location to carry out their hunting. And as a result of um, those, those whaling and, and sealing activities, the local native population of animals was absolutely decimated because these, wha these um, whalers and sealers introduced cats and, and, um, and rats and um, other feral animals that completely destroyed the local population. And so the, the text is essentially a, the story of how Macquarie Island 
the, the ecosystem of Macquarie Island was destroyed and is slowly being rebuilt um, by scientists. It's a fantastic text for sustainability, and it's got some really, really interesting um, links to historical documents, um, such as journal entries and advertisements, um, and they all kind of pop up. It's, again, a very hybrid text where um, it's both a story and an information text. And I feature, again, I featured this one in, in great detail in the Picture Books webinar, the last Picture Books webinar. So if you want to find out about that one again, um, feel free to, to have a look at it online. Um, playground will crop up quite a lot, just at the bottom left here. Playground will crop up quite a lot um, in the themes that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, this is a fantastic text compiled by Nadia Wheatley. And it is essentially a compilation of oral histories from indigenous people all over Australia. And it talks about their experiences under a number of different categories, such as family, um, fishing, going to school, all of those kind of aspects of life. And the idea of the, the title, Playground, is that for Aboriginal children, um, there isn't this concept of school where you learn and playground where you play. The place where they learn is also the playground. And it's about this, this attitude towards the world around you and, and the way that you learn and the way that you interact with, with, with people in the land um, from the sense of both learning and play. Okay, Surrealism for Kids, down the bottom here, is a text um, produced by the Queensland Art Gallery to accompany a Surrealist exhibition. And it's got some great procedures in it um, for how to make Surrealist artworks. There's some fantastic biographies of Surrealist artists and um, little features on, on their art. So if you, um, especially great for those, those, those rainy Friday afternoons where you want to do something fun with your kids and um, also get them to, um, to learn about a particular style of art, um, it's fantastic, really, really fun, and some really crazy surrealist um, artwork that you can produce. And finally, Fromel is about the Battle of Fromel, which um, you may or may not be familiar with, but was um, a very, very important battle um, during World War I for um, Australian soldiers. Um, it was a quite long forgotten battle, and only um, in the last sort of 10 years or so have they rediscovered some of the, the mass graves where, um, sadly, the Australian soldiers were buried after they lost their lives. And this text um, analyzes the Battle of Fromel. It analyzes, it gives you a timed um, time sequence, of, a chronological sequence of, of what happens throughout the battle, and also um, has an interesting analysis perspective in terms of what went wrong um, and why. So as well as being an information text, there's some really um, interesting opinions in there by the author and um, some fantastic information about, um, about living as a soldier in World War I as well as at the beginning of the text. So it's another one of these kind of hybrid texts that I've been talking about that's not just a, a kind of pure text that fits in into one category. It's an information text, it's a narrative, it's a recount, it's a visual text. Um, of course, with any text that involves war, again, you will want to think about um, the maturity of your students and what they can deal with because it is a very graphic, um, very graphic novel in places and obviously describes the horror of, of war and, um, and dying in no man's land. So. Okay, so that was a brief overview of the four categories and all the texts in the categories. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through um, the four, well, the um, three other curricula at the moment that um, you might want to think about linking the English curriculum to. Of course, the Australian Curriculum History and Australian Curriculum Science were already re released, and um, Geography is pretty much about to be released now. I think it's, it's almost, um, it, might even have, it might even be out. So essentially, this is, a way, this, is, this is a way of taking you through what those three other curricula, um, or the outline of those three other curricula, and then I'm going to take you through how you can interlink some themes um, through all those three curricula into some of the texts um, using the Australian English curriculum. So it's, it's exactly what you've been doing in your states with your syllabi with cross-curricular programming, but just sort of showing you how it maps onto the Australian curriculum. Okay, so in the Australian curriculum history, of course, you're studying one 
um, one topic per, per year. So you've got personal and family history, present and past family life, the past in the present, so that's local history, community and re remembrance, first contacts, the Australian colonies and Australia as a nation. Now, first contacts is um, essentially about the, the arrival of, of the British in, um, in, into Australia in the invasion or the colonization. And um, the Australian colonies is, talks about the initial establishment of Australia as a British colony. And then Australia as a nation, of course, takes you from Federation through World War I onwards. Um, in the geography curriculum, there are three main, it's divided into three main areas. You've got place, space, and environment. And um, within those areas, there are some, some quite good um, thematic links that, that, you can, um, that you can use for teaching some of these texts with. Um, science, this year, the only the only real link that you can make is through the biological sciences. I mean, some, some years, you know, you'll have other texts that will link to, to physical or chemical sciences, but just this year, the only um, real thematic links you can make are, are through biological sciences. And, of course, we always need to keep in mind the cross-curriculum priorities of sustainability, and there are some big, big, big themes of sustainability throughout many of the texts. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and culture, and I'll be looking at that um, as a category on its own in a minute, and Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia. Now, on those three curriculum priorities, um, there is actually a, um, a fantastic website called Global Words that Peter was involved um, in writing, along with um, a number of other organizations. And if you just, um, you can either access it through the Peter website or you can just Google Global Words and there are some units of work that have been produced specifically to address these cross-curriculum priorities. And the Little Refugee, actually, is, is one of the texts that is um, that's used in, as an example of that for um, Asia and Australia's engagement with, with Asia. So um, with the cross-curriculum priorities, I just want to draw your attention to Global Words, and it's a great resource if you want to find some, some other units that um, you might want to teach in the classroom. Okay. So... From those curriculum um, outlines and structures, um, I've devolved these themes. So the first is families and communities, which is mainly from the history curriculum and some geography. The next is time change and continuity, including heritage, traditions, British colonization, federation, and government systems. That's a big one. And sorry to those people who have already seen the, the F to 6 um, picture books webinar. I have to explain this again, otherwise the um, following content is not going to make any sense. Um, of course, you've got another theme is cultures, and that includes identity, so personal identity um, and cultural diversity. You've got environments, places, and spaces, and that's a really big one to link in geography, um, biological sciences, and history. Social systems and structures, um, and that's your kind of history and geography. And then finally, creativity and imagination. And the reason I've got creativity and imagination in there is just to keep in mind as well that obviously the arts curriculum is going to be coming out very shortly as well, along with the geography curriculum. Um, rather than tackling cross-curriculum uh, thematic programming with the arts syllabus as well, um, because that would just have been too much to do in, in, in one presentation, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, the arts syllabus is there and there are some texts that link brilliantly, so we'll go through that in a minute as well. And, of course, the other thing you need to keep in mind with the Australian curriculum are the general capabilities. So you've got intercultural understanding, ethical behaviour, personal and social capability, and critical and creative thinking. And those are the ones, of course, you've got literacy, numeracy, and ICT capability. And, of course, they come into most, well, literacy and ICT come into most texts anyway. But um, when thinking about programming in a cross-curricular um, format and thinking about themes, the intercultural understanding, ethical behaviour, personal and social capability and critical and creative thinking are really, really important. Okay, so now we're going to get into, um, oh, right, sorry, quick web poll. So I've gone through some of those themes. I might just um, click back. If you can type into the message box how you would program with um, some of these themes, can you, think of, can you think of something you're already doing in the classroom that would link back to one of the themes that I have outlined here? So, oh, sorry, it's a little poll box that's come on. So if you can just type in your answer there, that would be great. Have a little think about how these themes you've got here. They might already link to units of work you're teaching in the classroom through your state syllabi. They might be something that you're already doing through the Australian curriculum. 
It might be something that links to um, a text that you love. So if you type in your answers there, we can have a little look and see what people think. Actually, sorry, um, everyone. We've got a bit of a technical issue because we can't read we can't read the results of the web poll. Can I just ask you to type it in the message box in the bottom right hand? So just ignore that little box. We're going to get rid of that box that's on your screen. Just type it in the message box because then we can all share um, share your ideas. And I think it's a much better way than doing it as a web poll. So I saw that someone had written the Golden Door and what they were going to link that to the Golden Door for Democracy. Fantastic. That's a great one. Yeah. Very interesting. Concepts of democracy and autocratic rule and systems of government. Clever link. One small island for Antarctica, absolutely. Natural disasters, flood, that, that's brilliant. Integrates really, really well. To have a think about some of the units that you might be currently teaching through HSE or SOSI or Thylacine for endangered species, excellent, that's right. Yep. And also thinking about the dream of the thylacine, you can bring in the bilby as well because the bilby is currently um, listed as endangered as well. Sustainability, one small island, fantastic. Oh, Chinese Cinderella with Asian cultures, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So we might just um, move on, unless anyone's got any more contributions, and have a look at some of the literacy aspects or the literacy links. Um, so what I've done is I've taken all of the text and thought of some really great um, natural links for teaching certain aspects of literacy. Obviously, certain texts lend themselves really well to some aspects of um, literacy compared to the others. I've got the happiest refugees there of Asian cultures. Excellent, that's right. Okay, so in terms of um, narrative, obviously narrative um, nowadays, well, we're not teaching narrative through NAPLAN um, this year, but um, I think it's really important to break narrative down into a genre as well because I think it can help children to get a, a much stronger sense of, of the, the purpose and the context of, of, of their writing. So in terms of texts that link well to genres, um, fantasy, as you can see, you've got the Golden Door, Brother Band, Look a Book, No Bears, and The Last Viking, and they're all really great texts for fantasy and imagination, both in terms of creating fantasy worlds and also of the individual creating fantasy in an imaginative, um, imaginative fashion. The Good Old Adventure text, um, and again, if you have perhaps um, a really heavy um, boys class and you want to kind of address those those um, boys' literacy issues, adventure can be a great way to um, to engage them. I'm not saying that girls aren't interested in adventure. Of course they are. But um, this genre tends to tends to grab some of the boys, I think. Um, and that's, of course, The Golden Door, Brother Band, Nanbury, Look a Book, and The Last Viking. Um, fairy Tales, No Bears is brilliant for teaching fairy tales, and we'll go through that in a minute. Um, mystery, the mystery genre, I've already mentioned Verity Sparks and Crow Country. And the dilemma genre in terms of, um, you know, the human dilemma or the individual going through um, a dilemma situation, um, you've got Come Down Cat and the Runaway Hug to a, a certain extent. Um, so fictional texts in general. Um, so we looked at narrative genres and kind of broke that down. In a broader sense, a fictional text, um, again, we can break that down into kind of categories and subcategories. Um, historical fiction. As I'm sure you can gather, um, Nanbury, Verity, Sparks are really clear ones. Dream of a Thylacine, obviously, because it talks about um, extinction and that was a certain you know, period in, and a certain facet of Australian, um, of I guess the British colonization of Australia with the destruction of, of natural, um, of, of the native habitats and the, and the native species. Um, Crow Country um, talks, obviously, it goes back to the 1930s and Brother Band, even though it is essentially a fantasy text, it's got a lot of, um, it really draws heavily on, on the, the, the historical facts of, of, of Viking culture and, um, and, and mythology as well. Poetry, for all creatures and to some extent really nudie. Um, literary recounts, 
um, Bungawitta, Flood, a bus called Heaven, Dream of the Philistine. So again, these are just examples of text. So if you're, if you're choosing to text, if you're choosing to teach from a text type perspective or a purpose for writing perspective, hopefully, rather than a text type, um, you know, if you want to talk about text that recount or retell, um, these would be great texts to use as part of your study. And of course, you can draw out um, literary examples from these texts to use in, in your teaching of, of writing. And, oh, I've got, sorry, a repeat there in poetry. You've got four creatures and, of course, Dream of the Silasine as well. Sorry, a bit of an error there. And moving on to factual text. Um, the factual historical recount, you've got the little refugee um, playground on one small island. And oral histories. Playground is fantastic for oral histories. If you want to think about oral history, also as a, as a genre, um, playground is a very, very interesting text. And there's some great links between that transition from oral language to written language and how um, you can record the oral as written and whether or not you should change um, oral language to written language as you write. Um, informative writing, Bilby Secrets is, is a great inf informational text. Um, gives you lots of information about the Bilby and its habitats and its life cycle. Um, instructional writing, so following instructions, procedures, surrealism for should be kids, not fids. Sorry about that. And explanatory writing, again, I mentioned that's not a daffodil, which explains the um, the life cycle of a daffodil. And I guess also if you want to talk about life cycles, the bilby kind of links into that explanatory writing as well. So hopefully that gives you a brief overview of um, how you can use some of those texts to link to fictional and, um, and, and factual studies of, of text in your classroom. And um, some other things just to kind of think about. If you really want to think about teaching visual literacy and the skills of visual literacy, um, look a book, The Little Refugee and Dream of the Thylacine have got some fantastic, um, really clear elements in terms of visual literacy that you can teach to, both as a skill and as a way to decode uh, a visual and multimodal text. Intertextuality, so, and I'll just explain my terminology there. What I'm talking about is text that reference other well-known texts or genres. So Look A Book um, obviously talks about how to care for, for books in general and references um, the concept of the book itself as well as being a story on its own. No Bears, brilliant intertextual references to very well-known fairy tales. And we'll go through, like I said, we'll go through that in a minute and you'll see all of your favorite fairy tale characters appear. And um, The Last Viking has got some great intertextual links with Norse and Viking mythology, um, with the gods and some of the stories and the concepts of Valhalla. And um, One Small Island has got some fantastic examples of, I think I've already mentioned, some journals, um, historical recounts, diary entries, um, there's some adverts, there's, there's images, all sorts of texts that have been slowly gathered over the history of, of, the, um, of the island and they've just been re reworked by the author and illustrator for, for, the, for this text, for this book, but they have very sound um, historical factual um, roots. And hybrid texts, so texts that um, aren't purely one genre or another, they kind of mix in a number of genres or a number of different styles and purposes for writing. Four Creatures is a fantastic hybrid text between poetry and an information text. As I mentioned, there's a lot of meta-language to do with, um, with the various animals and, um, and also the images create a hybrid text as well between the visual, the poetic and the informational. Bilby Secrets is a hybrid text that we'll go through in a minute that um, interweaves both informative and narrative or recounting writing. Look at Daffodil, I've already explained, is both a narrative and an explanation or an explanatory text. No Bears is a really interesting hybrid between what is essentially an oral recount and a written narrative. So that's a, again, we'll be looking at that and that's, that's a very um, thoughtful and interesting way to, to create a story and it's very much about authorship and um, the, 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 the meta process of, of, of authoring. And One Small Island, as I mentioned, is a real hybrid of, of lots of different information texts. And also as a, a story and a, and a recount that um, the author unashamedly takes quite a strong position as narrator. So 
you can clearly understand when you read the text, this is not a dry informational historical recount about what happened. The author is lamenting the fact that these things happened and is also talking hopefully about how the future can, can change this text. And then finally, um, Playground, of course, is a, is a hybrid text between the actual written format and the oral format of language. And um, again, some really interesting um, some really interesting questions are thrown up by the way in which oral language is recorded in a written format and how that translates across on the page. Okay, so now we're going to um, get into um, looking at some of the text in a little bit more detail. Um, and we're first of all going to be looking at the themes of the past and history and tradition. So we're looking at British colonization and history and tradition. So we're just going to switch to um, some scanned images from, from these texts. And I'll take you through what's going on. Sorry, just having a drink there. Okay. So what I've done is I've scanned in a few pages from each text just to kind of um, just to kind of demonstrate how the texts link in. So as you can see um, here, the first text that we're going to talk about is Nanbury, and this has got really clear links to British colonisation. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Nanbury in quite a lot of detail um, in, in a little bit um, in the presentation, so I won't go into it too much. But what you've got is um, the British colonisation or the early colonisation of, of um, Australia from the perspective of both an Aboriginal boy and um, a surgeon who was stationed here and um, a convict woman. So you've got Nanbury here describing his early life in the colony. The wind snickered between the trees like an old woman and laughing and it, all the languages is, is in the style and, and, um, and the format of, of, of the indigenous voice and it also talks about his attitude towards the white people and we'll go through this a bit later and then you've got the perspective from Surgeon White um, reaching and he, he narrates really um, really quite thoughtfully and, and, and vividly what it's like to be a doctor treating the convicts who arrive um, you know, I think a lot, of the, a lot of the time you think about convicts, you not necessarily think about the human story that um, associates with their journey. And um, Surgeon White kind of brings it out really well. He talks about um, how so many died on the ships and, and, and the state that they're in when they arrive in Australia. Okay, so this is um, a quote now. This is moving on to Verity Sparks. And again, so this is just a little example to um, to illustrate how brilliantly talks about British colonization and British history. So this is, um, this is a scene where Verity has to go to um, a rich person's house. Now Verity is a foundling, so she doesn't know who her parents are, and um, she just got fired from her job, and what she has to do is she has to, go to, um, she has to go to this rich person's house to do a delivery. And Ruddy how I said to myself, pardon the language, here goes, and I ran up to the front door and lifted the knocker. It was loud enough to wake the dead, and seconds later, a uniformed maid, no longer, no older than me, opened the door. She took one glance and decided she didn't need, need didn't, she decided she didn't, you needn't waste her manners. What? And so on. So it talks, it characterises really well the different classes and the class system that you found in, in Victorian Britain and how it was virtually impossible to move between them. And of course, at the other end, it also talks about. Um, Verity it gives some some really good kind of background um, color in the settings um, about the slums of Victorian England and the states that that some of the um, some of the kids are in. So I'll just read from here. But almost at once I knew I picked the wrong mark. The faces that turned towards me were something out of a nightmare, all blooming with sores and bruises, teeth missing, eyes glittering. I could smell their stinking rags and the gin on their breath. So there's some really fantastic color, both of the, the, the slums and that you know really lower class kind of poverty situation that um, you found in Victorian Britain. And on the other extreme, Verity gets adopted into uh, a very well-to-do family, and it talks about the disconnection that she has between um, essentially what are those two different cultural experiences. Okay, moving on. So um, obviously one of the other texts that links in really well to a concept of past and history and tradition is Playground which of course is the oral histories um, collected by indigenous people. And each, um, 
each sort of section of the text is uh, I've, um, prefaced with a little introduction here about the concept by Nadia Wheatley. And um, so this is about journeying and, and about how um, Aboriginal people were pushed off their land and moved to different places, but also how they, um, how they journeyed themselves on walkabout. And there's um, great oral histories here from different people from different eras talking about their experiences of, of journeying through the land, either through choice or, or being forced. This, is, this text is from One Small Island. As I mentioned briefly, it refers to both letters and diary entries and journals. You can see here you've got um, a letter from William, who's a sealer, and then you've got um, an account from an overseer um, who's in charge of um, one, of the, one of the missions, and you've got the um, number of seal um, oil casks that, that they're getting. As you can see, there are really clear links to the history of the island in terms of sealing and whaling. And then, of course, the history in different eras. So this is um, in the 40s when it um, first became a scientific station. And, of course, moving through to the 80s, you've got um, a, a, bit of a, a bit of a diary entry here and a letter. Okay, moving on to another text. So this is um, Crow Country, and this is a section... Where, she, um, where Sadie has gone back in time, in the time slip, and she's back in the 1930s, and she is um, essentially overhearing a discussion between um, her dad. She goes back in time and becomes this, this other girl. And, um, and Jimmy, who is a local um, Aboriginal man who had gone to World War I and, and fought in the war, but he, um, you know, and, and he's come back and he's still facing just um, terrible um, racism and um, really kind of um, horrible attitudes from the local population. This girl's dad doesn't treat him that way, but everyone else does. So um, Mr. Mortlock is one of the characters who kind of um, represents that ingrained attitude, that ingrained racist attitude towards, um, towards Aboriginal people. And um, it's a really great text to go into um, past attitudes and how attitudes um, have changed over, you know, in, in the last sort of, 50 to 80 years. Okay. And this is from Fromel. Obviously, as a past text, it's got very, very clear um, clear links. There are posters um, from World War I. There are little ex explanations about the Western Front and, um, and also some little um, information boxes that pop up that give you more background. Um, so as well as a study of, of an individual battle, it gives the reader um, lots of really quality information about the experience on the Western Front um, and generally the Australian experience in World War One. Like I say, and it, it um, also has um, some photos and um, diary entries as well. And a map, of course, of the, um, of the battle. So as you can see, it's gone through in a timeline here. So as a study, as a really close study of a particular historical event, this text lends itself very well. And um, the Happiest Refugee. This text link, links in really well to concepts of past if you're looking, especially from the Asian perspective, about what it was like to originally live in Vietnam and um, what happened to the boat people who were displaced as a result of the end of the war. Um, so the text of the first part of the, t the, first part of the text deals with, deals with these, these issues and um, especially about the journey. Okay, and finally, the last text in, um, in this theme is um, Brother Band. And I've just got an example here where um, Hal, who is in charge of the um, Brother Band, he's there, they're a rather, um, how shall I put it, unsuccessful team initially, but um, all these concepts of kind of identity and leadership come out in, 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 Hal's, in Hal's journey. And this is a section where they're essentially building a, um, a Viking longhouse. And there's lots of, um, lots of technical and historical information in this text about um, Viking longboats and about sailing and about Viking ways of life and um, structures in Viking society. So if you wanted to do a study on that, it would lend itself really well. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next theme now, and that's the theme of family. There's only a few books in this one. It's not quite as big and as overwhelming. And I might race through this one quite quickly. So this one is The Runaway Hug. And as I mentioned, it's about Lucy who gives her hug, and um, it lends itself very well to um, questions for those younger children about who's in your family, 
and um, getting them to create texts about their family, their family structure, and um, think about their relationships. Obviously, all families are different, and this is just an example of, of what one looks like. And Rudy Nudy, again, a different kind of um, family structure, and um, another text that lends itself really well for those for those younger children about the relationships and the importance of the relationships with, with parents and siblings and extended family and what your family looks like. So again, these, are, these texts are good jumping off points for students to create their own texts about their own families and their own family experiences. And of course it ends there with um, them being tucked into bed at night. And obviously family um, also has a really strong um, theme in playground and I know that I touched on these three texts in, in the last um, webinar, so I'll, I'll just go through really quickly. Um, family in playground is not just um, family in the sense of, of a Western or Western civilization concept of family, where it's mother, father, um, brother and sister, but your extended skin system and the concept behind that. Um, and it, it treats both the relationships between that immediate nuclear family and also the relationships between the skin systems and, and the, the clans and, and groups in, um, in Aboriginal culture. So it's a really interesting expanded look at family. Okay, so we're going to move on to look at the theme of communities and culture and the text that lend itself to these. And of course, very strongly running through um, the theme of flood is that sense of community and people coming together um, in, in the face of natural disaster and adversity. And the whole text is, is positioned from the perspective of the community response to the floods and how, um, and how it made such a difference um, as a result of the disaster. So as you can see, there's lots of illustrations of, of what people did and how they contributed. Um, it's also, for, from a literary perspective, the text is, is it's quite brief, but it's, it's very um, lyrical and poetic and quite, quite moving, actually. And so as a study of a way to, to narrate and, um, and recount a natural disaster from a really literary perspective, the text um, lends itself really well to a study of that. So you've got the community and the cultural coming together. Um, as I mentioned before, those images look like they've kind of been flooded out with the, with the use of watercolour. So there's lots of great visual imagery in this as well. Um, a Bus Called Heaven is a fantastic book about how a community comes together. And we'll be analysing A Bus Called Heaven in a minute, and we'll be talking about community um, very strongly in that. So I'll just move straight through. And of course, in Playground, I said, I said I'd be talking about Playground a lot. Playground has a very strong sense of... Um, of, of community and, and, and cultural background. Um, obviously, the communities within um, different skin groups and different um, clans, but also the communities are for, that, that are formed between Aboriginal people when they were put in the missions and the different experiences they had at different um, eras in, um, in Australian history and how the historical perspective um, also kind of impacted their sense of community and their experience of community. As you can see, there's some great pictures. And um, moving on to The Little Refugee, this obviously is about, it's really about two different communities. It's about the community of, of refugees who all went on the boat together and how this experience threw them together and um, essentially forced them to become a very close-knit group. And then it's also about the community of um, of Australia and how Ando has to kind of straddle the, these, these two communities and, you know, keep one foot in his Vietnamese background, but then also um, try and learn about um, Australian culture in Sydney and, and, and assimilate and learn the language. So um, it's a really fantastic text for a study of what it's like to experience two different communities, two language backgrounds, especially if you're teaching in a, a school with a heavy ESL perspective. And Bungawitta, um, which you can see here, is obviously it's all about community. There's actually only 12 people in the community of Bungawitta, and it's about how they spend a lot of their time together, most of them um, unemployed because the drought has had such a, a terrible impact and decimated the local economy. So. It talks about how, as a community, they come together to try and solve their problems in a really productive and proactive way. And it, it's a lovely little story about how um, 
how you can overcome adversity with um, from a sense of community and 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 also it's about rural culture and um, what is special about some of those places um, that perhaps city people wouldn't wouldn't visit and it's also um, the, the book talks about how city people are encouraged to come out to the festival and how much they love the outback and and how they love the experience they all have to camp in a field and and build their earth sculptures and um, it's it's a great text to think about how one community in Australia can be so different to another community. As you can see here, you've got your your kind of stereotypical um, outback characters as well, doing all their different roles in the community with the tractor. Okay. And now we're going to move on to look at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. We have kind of touched on some of this um, a little bit, but obviously it is um, a major cross-curriculum perspective, so I think it's really important to treat it um, here when you're talking about the text in this year's shortlist. Um, Crow Country has a really strong um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective. It talks about one particular um, one particular group of Aboriginal people with um, whose dreaming is Wa the Crow and um, it talks about how a girl finds a sacred site and about the responsibility of a sacred site. Sorry, we've just had a little bit of a computer um, failure there. Can you just let me know if you can still hear me? Can you say yes, you can still hear me? Okay. Okay, all right, we might just move on. Um, whilst I'm talking about, thanks guys, yeah, sorry about that. We've just got to reboot up the computer. Got enough technology. Um, I'll keep talking about um, Atsi culture. We don't always need the text to, to talk about it. So, um, like I mentioned, in Crow Country, it's about the discovery of a sacred site and also about the responsibility that um, we hold in the modern day towards respecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders respecting their culture, respecting their community, and how um, in some ways we can right the wrongs of the past. Um, it has some interesting links to the concept of sorry, if you're perhaps studying the, the sorry speech and the sorry generation, um, in the sense that um, a sacred, as well as a sacred site, a sacred object is found, and because a white person finds this sacred object, she actually returns it to a traditional auntie who then um, you know, has the right um, who knows what ceremonies to, to do to kind of right this past wrong, this, this murder of the Aboriginal man. And um, it's, it, it just, yeah, it, it's a really, really lovely book to, to consider how we need to be respectful of, of Aboriginal culture and, and, and of the culture that still exists and lives around us. Okay, the next text that deals with Aboriginal culture is, of course, Playground, and we've talked about that quite a lot. Obviously, you can tell really clearly that it's completely about um, the Indigenous experience in Australia. So I might uh, just move on to, from that one. And, of course, Nambri, which is the final text in the theme, um, obviously half of the text is written from the perspective of um, a young indigenous boy, he's actually one of the only survivors from his, his clan because smallpox wipes out most of them. And um, like I mentioned, we'll be talking about Nambri in, in greater detail in a minute, but really it's about his experience as an Aboriginal child looking at white culture. But it also interestingly treats his, um, it talks about his, his perspective and his place within Aboriginal culture and how because he's not initiated, the um, the um, warriors won't actually speak to him as a translator because he learns English and um, they ignore him. So it's it's pretty interesting. All right, sorry about this. Um, sorry about this this vision failure. We're working desperately to um, sort out the technology. I might just keep going and um, have a bit of a talk about the, the two final themes because um, we've only got a little bit of time left to look at the remaining text. So environment and sustainability is a really, really strong theme in this year's um, 2012 shortlist. There are one, two, three, four, five, six um, texts, seven texts that lend themselves really, really well to study of environment and sustainability as a theme. Um, Bilby Secrets, which we will um, look at. So there's everyone. Okay. So I think we're just about to come back online. 
Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so we're just going to switch to um, to the, the scans that I'm looking at at the moment about environment and sustainability. So sorry about that brief technical glitch, guys. Okay. Um, okay, all right. I might just keep going. So Bilby Secrets, like I mentioned, talks about environment and sustainability from the perspective of the Bilby being an endangered creature. Um, and it helps your students to understand um, about the animal, the bilby, and um, why it's special and why it's unique, and especially why its habitat um, is so special, because it's obviously the bilby only lives in certain areas of the Western Desert. So um, it's a really great text to study in the context of a specific habitat and environment. And of course, if you're thinking from that perspective, one small island is a really great um, link to, to how um, animals are so dependent upon their habitat, and of course, dream of the thylacine as well. Um, all of which, you know, all of which were native animals that, that that only lived in very specific habitats. Okay, so we've got the vision back here, hopefully, and we're looking at Bilby Secrets. So as you can see, you've got the habitat of the Western Desert, and um, it explains about the bilby and um, and its life cycle. One small island, like I briefly talked about. Um, again, it talks about the fragile balance between the animals and the plants and the native animals there. Um, from both the perspective of environment, it is interesting because um, it, it's quite a unique environment being so close to Antarctica, but also from the perspective of sustainability, of course, because it wasn't, um, its natural resources weren't uh, fished or hunted sustainably, and um, the way that people lived on the island wasn't in a... Um, wasn't in a very sustainable way, and so as a result, the whole island was, was decimated. You can see here, obviously, it's very clearly not sustainable with the way in which they're hunting and, and what's going on. And this is, um, in terms of environment as a, a concept or a study of animals, um, I've mentioned a couple of times you've got four creatures. And um, as I said, it, it's a kind of a poetic quartet here. You've got for weavers and wisps, for silk spinners and spiderlings, lace and loveliness, and for webs, we are thankful. And it's just, a, I've mentioned it, it's a nice way to introduce some of the meta language associated with animals. Um, and it's just, it, it, it's a good little text um, to show that there are other ways of, of building up technical vocabulary than just through an informational text. And so you've got for critalis and camouflage, for unfurling, unfolding, and unveiling, marvels and mysteries of metamorphosis, we are thankful. And the text goes on to deal with lots of different animals, and finally humans as well. And it, um, it's a nice little text to think about how, as humans and, and animals, we live in a, in a connected environment, which, of course, we have to treat sustainably if we are to continue. Flood, we've already looked at a little bit. Obviously, um, in environment there, you're talking about... Um, some of the harsh environmental extremes that you um, experience, that we experience in Australia, but also um, probably some great links to concepts of wider concepts of global warming and um, responsibilities in terms of your um, environmental attitude and perspective to the way in which you live, um, in terms of building a really sustainable way of living for the future. So, um, and it also talks about the environment from that natural disaster perspective and how the natural disaster happens because of course there's so much rain and the land can't um, can't um, deal with, with that much rain and of course it turns into the savage floods which had that horrible wave. Dream of the thylacine, um, excellent text for sustainability in terms of already endangered um, animals, sorry, excuse me, already extinct animals. Um, again, you can study that in um, in uh, um, a parallel with One Small Island and Bilby Secrets, where you're looking at animals that are both extinct, endangered, and vulnerable. Um, and of course, the text itself doesn't really talk much about, specifically about um, the thylacine. It does give great visual, visual and verbal images of the, inv the, the habitat of the thylacine. Um, and, and you know how beautiful the Tasmanian um, the Tasmanian habitat is, but it also talks about sustainability from the, the perspective of how sad it is that this amazing beautiful creature um, has now disappeared forever from our world. 
And for those of you who haven't um, had a look at Dream of the Thylacine, each, um, each section of, of the text is prefaced by these, this incredible poetry. So there's this, in, this incredible kind of um, poetic literary language and then a sequence of three images that, that show the Thylacine kind of raging and, and, and hunting through the Tasmanian landscape. Um, so this text at the bottom here that I'm circling with my mouse, know you not that I am tooth and claw, see me hunt through bracken and bush, see me swagger across wild lands, see me glory at the edge of a cliff. So this little bit at the bottom um, in the text actually shows the different habitats and environments that the thylacine um, kind of travels through in his journey in, in Tasmania. There you go, and you've got some image there. And of course, environment from the perspective of what do living things need, um, you know, a great kind of science, early, early years science unit, I'm sure we've all done it. Um, you've got, obviously, the daffodil needs sort of sunlight and water to grow, and it talks about the life cycle of the daffodil, daffodil excuse me, and, and how it changes as it grows. As you can see, it's a little beak. Now it's got green fingers. And um, another, sorry, moving on quickly there. I know we're, we're kind of racing, but we've got a lot to get through. Um, Fungawitter, of course, talks about the environment and sustainability from the perspective of drought, from the perspective of climate change, um, extreme weather events, and also the impact that the environment can have on communities of people and how communities of people need to, le le need to learn to live sustainably with the land around them and perhaps adapt the way in which they live and the way in which their communities function so that they can stay there um, in these change conditions. And of course, the community um, maintains its sustainability, not from the perspective of, um, of perhaps the resources it uses, but its sustainability as a community of people who can live there as a community by, of course, creating this, this festival, which brings in money and tourists, which enables the town to essentially continue. And of course, at the end, you've got, um, yeah, at the end of Bungawetu, of course, we've got the fantastic um, description of the drought actually breaking and, and again what that can be like and what an impact that will have on the community. Okay, and the last one that we are going to look at is creativity and imagination. And I've included this one because I think um, it's really, really important to, to encourage our students to think creatively, to use use their imaginations and to access those, those parts of them. And these are real 21st century skills, and they're being talked about a lot more, um, thank God, in, 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 um, in education, schools, and classrooms. So I think there's some text here that lend themselves really, really well to, to kind of getting your, your students to unleash their creativity and their imagination. No Bears is about, I've mentioned, it's about a little girl who, who writes her own text, uses her imagination to create her own narrative, and we'll be looking at that in a minute. Look a book is all about how imagination can free you, and um, it's got so many layers. This text visually, those of you who who looked at the last, um, who attended the last picture book webinar will will remember I took you through the whole text. Um, but essentially, from an imaginative and, and a creative perspective, what the author and illustrator have done here is created another text within the text, created a visual text that is completely imaginary and creative, and somewhat sits at contrast to, to the language. So it's a really interesting study of how you can demonstrate concepts of uh, creativity and imagination in, in your writing and your illustrating. As you can see here, they're flying over telegraph poles where there's washing hanging off them. And they've made their own little sailing boat, well, their own flying ship, really, out of, out of a bit of the tin shed and the sheet. And of course, in terms of creativity, um, as a text that studies an, a past extinct animal, um, Dream of the Silocene is, is incredibly rich and imaginative and creative. Um, you've got the, the poetic language at the, at the beginning, the really sharp literary use of, use of language in a literary sense, and then these just really evocative, thoughtful images that, that go with it. And it's a great example of, of students, so it's a great example for students um, of how, to, how you can create a text with um, with a limited amount of, of actual written words, but you can have something very dense and very layered and very rich. So it would lend itself really well 
to a kind of deep in-depth study by, by stage um, stage three, so year five, year, year six students. And as you can see, you've got some of those beautiful images from Dream with a Thylacine there. And finally, um, the Surrealism book, um, The Surrealist Artist, and you've got a study here. Each, each, um, the book's divided into, it's divided by artists. So you've got obviously Dali, you've got um, here Andre Breton, and there's a little bio about each artist and um, some little some examples of their work. <laughs> this is um, one of a, a photograph of him, and then how to play that surreal um, set procedure set of instructions so you can make your own artwork inspired by the artwork of, of the artist. So again, that's a really, really clear link for imagination and creativity for your kids and also hopefully to to enable them to understand that art doesn't have to be one-dimensional um, surrealism is a great way to kind of get them to free their imaginations and, and, and go nuts in the classroom all right we're going to go and look at um, a few texts in detail now aware we've only got technically seven minutes left I might go a little bit over maybe five minutes if that's okay and we're going to have a look at um, Nambury, which is um, in the older readers, sorry, in the younger readers section. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you through some of the little features of Nambury and how you might want to use it more specifically from a, a literature um, perspective in the classroom rather than a, a somatic perspective. Um, what's interesting about this text is the different, um, the different voices, the different narrating voices. Um, that, that are used. You've got Nambury, and the way that um, the author has crafted the language is, is quite interesting um, because everything is described from the perspective of his experience. Um, so it's, it's a very, very strong indigenous voice that comes through. Um, there's also indigenous language. So though the, though the Murray Noe had floated away, the white ghosts had not. They'd stayed through the whole sky full of seasons. So you're looking at the way in which um, indigenous people relate to the world around them, or this particular, um, this particular, the, the Cadigal, who of course um, were native to, to Sydney Cove when the first British came here. So scrolling down the page here, um, obviously you've got, um, and what's also interesting is the perspective of colonisation from uh, an Aboriginal, um, an Aboriginal point of view and how kind of ineffective and um, almost, you know, he, he can't even understand how these people can, can survive. He talks about um, how the white ghosts, the white people tried to attack the category women, though the women had fought them and run off, that even made the stream a filthy, stinking thing. Didn't white, white ghost mothers tell their children how important it was to keep the water clean? And then... Um, it goes on to talk about, so in, in the early section of the text, it just talks about his experiences as an Aboriginal child living in Sydney Cove. And then, of course, you've got the perspective of Surgeon White, who really quite resents the fact that, um, that he's been stationed to this, this god-awful hole in, in this, at the end of the earth. He's surprised to find out that the king's gone mad and there's been a French Revolution um, three years after he's been there when the first white ships arrive, um, sorry, the, the second fleet arrives. And um, again, a really interesting a really interesting analysis of narrative perspective and narrative voice and how it can contrast with the other narrative voices in the text. So what you'll see is sometimes the same event recounted from those differing perspectives and it enables you as the reader to really, um, to really kind of have a, a quite an a rounded picture of what's going on rather than, of course, when you read a text, there's usually only one authorial voice or, or narrator. And you've also got the voice of um, Maria, who is one of the servant girls, and Rachel as well. So here, um, there's also a, a great scene about how Nambury in this text is... Um, he's, I guess he's marginalised a number of different times. You know, the white people don't accept him because he's a native and they call him a savage and they can't believe that he can learn English and he can wear English clothes and eat at a table. Um, his, the survivors from his tribe and, and uh, for his group and, and some of the other um, 
Aboriginal people who come into Sydney won't speak to him because he's not an initiated warrior and they um, call him a beetle and, and ignore him. And so he's kind of marginalised by his own people because he's also kind of wearing white clothes and has gone over to that side. And ironically, even though he calls people white ghosts, really that white ghost concept is, is actually a metaphor for Nanbury himself. And another interesting metaphor that runs throughout the whole text is that of the opossum, which um, certain white finds this possum and adopts it and he, um, and of course, the, the white people in the text think that you can't tame this native animal. Well, this native animal becomes tamed, lives with um, Surgeon White, and it's kind of like a pet and a plaything. And really, that's kind of the role that Nanbury takes on in, in the extended um, British colony. They kind of treat him as, as, as a joke and a pet and a plaything. And as he grows up and goes through um, the colonies, you've got here um, this this interesting text where Nanbury is trying to talk to um, he's trying to talk to the local warriors and they're not looking at Nanbury so I'm looking at this section here and then of course Nanbury is also privileged to what the white people are saying um, and so and they're saying just get them natives close enough so we can grab one so Nanbury's kind of got all these conflicting emotions going on throughout the text about who he is, what is his identity, and, and who he belongs to. And again, um, the author explores this really well in terms of um, us being able to see inside Nanbury's thoughts and his, his mind. And of course, we've looked at the scene from hell there. And then finally, at the end of the text, um, oh, this, there's um, some... There's also some narration by Rachel, who is a convict woman. Um, and again, she's got a different perspective again from Surgeon White because she, she has his kind of, uh, I guess, really philosophical attitude towards life. You know, she was a convict. She thought she was going to get hanged. She got a pardon. She got shipped over here. She avoided, um, she avoided some of the worst things that can happen to women on the convict ship. So anyway... We're running out of time. I'm going to move on really quickly because these um, these chapter books kind of don't lend themselves quite well to, quite so well to this webinar format. So I'm going to go and move on really quickly to look at um, the next text, which is A Book Called Heaven. And sorry we're running a little bit over time, guys. As you can see, there's so much to get through. Okay, so A Book Called Heaven um, is... From a literary perspective, there's quite a lot going on here that you can um, you can pull different bits out um, to, to um, help a study of the text with your students. Stella, the characterisation of Stella and the characterisation of the community is quite interesting. So you've got the people stopped and talked together, just a little, but they talked. So immediately you've got this concept of, you know, just in that one sentence, you've got this concept of a fractured community that's starting to come together. And little Stella is a quiet, um, quiet, unheard, you know, quiet, kind of reticent little girl who, um, who doesn't have much confidence, you know. Stella changed too. She took her thumb from her mouth. So there's some fantastic characterization around Stella and about the changes she goes through as an individual as a result of the relationship with this bus. Um, also, when you're looking at setting, it's a really great way to think about how images can enhance the setting in, in a text without talking about setting too much itself. Um, and as you go through, you can see Stella's kind of growing in confidence, as she said louder. There's some, um, especially with younger kids, if you're teaching things like exclamatory sentences and um, reading with emphasis, there's some really clear um, sections of the text where um, the author and illustrator have kind of um, highlighted them in bold and, and done a different style font and there's also the visual literacy if you have a look here of the buildings kind of almost the buildings look like they're leaning back in in surprise and, and shock that the community is coming together to create this community bus so as you go through they push the bus off the road and they start to turn it into a community center and little sparrows and snails sink in And the whole community comes together to clean up the bus. And it's interesting that quite a lot of it's done from that bird's eye view perspective um, because it really sets that context of what it's like to, to live in a big city and to feel kind of alone and quite small and quite lost. 
um, and yet how you can start to have a community focal point. I'd be thinking immediately of studying this text with something like um, Belonging by Jeannie Baker. There's some really great links there in, about how communities can come together and, and improve their way of life. Um, there's also a really, really great multicultural um, perspective from this book, um, just, just in, in all the different names um, and, and in terms of the, um, the outfits that some of the, some of the people are wearing as well. So it really kind of enhances. There's lots going on in this text, in, in, in the words themselves, but also in, um, in the actual images. So everyone kind of comes together and uses the bus, and then the bus is threatened um, because it's, um, of course, contradicting council bylaw. And so it gets towed away. You can see here, as I've talked about, there are some, the bus has to go. There's some interesting use of, um, of kind of bold and, and font to draw attention to different, different aspects of the text. And then also um, this visual literacy as, as they're kind of drawing out further and back as, as the bus is being dragged away through the city. And then, of course, the colours that are involved in this scrapyard. You know, the bus is the only colourful thing here. Everything's drab and grey, which, again, kind of emphasises the mood. So from a visual perspective, there's a lot going on in this text as well. OK, I am aware we're running out of time, so we're just going to race through. Um, we are going to have a little look at No Bears. I don't think we're going to get time to do the activity. I'm terribly sorry. Um, hopefully, you are finding um, you, you're kind of getting some ideas as you're going through how you can use these texts. Yes, there will be a recorded version of this webinar. I'm so sorry we've kind of raced through it. Like I said, there's, there's, when you're trying to cover 24 books in an hour and a half, um, it, it, it has to be a little bit rushed. Okay, so um, no bears. This is a really, really, really great book. I'd be immediately thinking about using it to teach the craft of writing and the role of the author. So that. Um, so in getting across to, to students that difference between oral language, where you are um, you kind of stream of consciousness talking, hi, I'm Ruby, and this is my book. You can tell it's a book because there's words everywhere. Um, and they're moving into that written language format where she actually starts creating the, um, the narrative. And also she obviously talks about the genre of fairy tale and how you see this language coming up again and again and again. The most important thing about Ruby's book is there's no bears. And it also, again, as a concept, um, can get across to your students that as an author, you are a creator. You choose what you can put in. You choose what you can leave out. And um, it, it's an interesting kind of study in terms of what the author can actually, um, can actually include and the scope of, of, of their writing. And, of course, you've got her narrating... Her, her attitudes and her feelings verbally or orally um, about bears, but then of course she starts writing her story. So she talked about all the things she thinks she needs in her book, and then she starts writing her book, and of course she immediately switches into that, um, that written language format with that traditional once upon a time. And you can tell when she's writing the text because there's this lovely line of the spiral bound notebook so you know that she's actually telling the story in terms of the written language when you see these pages. And then so she's also, as well as writing the story, she's narrating how she's writing the story as she's writing it. And she's also interweaving all, all of these different fairy tale characters. So it's a really rich, um, dense text. So here she is. She's explaining there's no bears anywhere. There's no bears in the deep, dark forest in the faraway lands. But what there was in the deep, dark forest in the faraway lands was a monster. And then she talks about how the monster, and of course you've got little red riding hood down here. The monster wants to steal the princess away to, um, to read him in bedtime stories. And so rather, um, I actually think of parallels to Shrek, when Shrek has to go through all of the different kingdoms to go and rescue Princess Fiona. There's some interesting, um, interesting kind of parallels here with the monster going through all these different kingdoms. You know, is he a monster like Shrek? Um, and of course, he eventually finds the princess. But of course, who always saves princesses? Fairy godmothers. So the fairy godmother <laughs> saves the princess, vanishes, um, vanquishes the, the, the monster. 
and everyone lives happily ever after, of course. And everyone being all of these characters that you'll find in um, the other fairy tales. So, you know, you've got the um, you've got the big bad wolf here. You've got some of the little pigs. You've got Red Riding Hood. Is that the Mad March Hare? I'm not entirely sure, actually. Um, it's half the fun of this text, you get to guess. And then, of course, you've got Ruby at the end, going back to her narration, going back to her oral narration. Wow, this turned out to be a pretty good book, don't you think? In fact, I think this has been the prettiest, most exciting, scariest, and funniest book ever. And I know why, because, of course, there's no bears in it. So as you can see, there's, there's a lot going on in this text. Um, there's a great introduction to narrative writing for children, uh, for younger children. But also I think it's a really interesting study for older students about how an author has treated the concept of writing as well as the process of writing. And finally, last text we're going to look at today. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. We're just going to spend the final three minutes. I know we've overrun. I'm so sorry. Okay, no worries for going. I'm very sorry that um, we overran. Thanks, Bernadette and everyone in Darwin. Hope you enjoy a nice cocktail in the sunset. Um, okay, so we're just going to move to look at Bilby Secrets quickly. And if you have to go, thank you for attending. Okay, Bilby Secrets, as I've talked about, is a hybrid text, and it covers both information and, um, and narrative or recount. So you've got the story, really, of the, of the Bilby here and the mother in this straight text, and then you've got this in a different color, a highlight at the bottom, you've got this kind of italicized text that actually is the pure information. So you've got, in the moonlight, Mother Bilby canters tail aloft like a banner across the spinifex and enters a steeply sloping spiral tunnel. She flings the dirt back, hind feet together, closing the entrance to her burrow. It's time for the birth of her baby. So as you can see, that's a, very much a, a recount or a narrative structure, but then you've got the informational text that kind of supports but doesn't repeat it. Bilbies dig their burrows in clay or loam or gibber, not in sand. The burrows are about two meters underground and are about three meters long. So the text continues in this way with images of the Bilby's life cycle and the Bilby's habitat, which again, aren't, the habitat is, an, is only treated visually, which is interesting again. Um, but then in each in each page, you've got both the, the recount, the narrative kind of dram dramatized version of the Bilby from the Bilby's perspective and the Bilby's experiences of life. And then you've got the factual um, information underneath that kind of corresponds to it. So from a, a literacy perspective, there's, some, there's a few different activities you can do here. Um, you, can, you can actually swap the sections and perhaps, so this one here, you've got Bilby's have poor eyesight, but their senses of hearing and smell are acute, so they constantly listen and sniff for danger. Um, you could get the students to write that in the narrative or recount perspective from, from, the, Bilby's, from the Bilby's point of view. And then um, this text at the top, when mother wakes, she's hungry. She waits until darkness descends and leaves the burrow, pausing for a moment at the tunnel entrance. So what you'd ask students to do is turn that into an informational text. So um, for example, you'd say something like, Bilby's are mainly nocturnal, um, hunting, as you can see in, in, the, in the background there, hunting moths and insects. Um, after the sunset. So that's just an example of a, of a good literacy activity you can do with this text that, for me, ran really strongly throughout. Okay, I'll just take you through some of the images there. And the whole thing, as I said, is set chronologically as the life cycle of a bilby. So again, you've got that scientific, um, that scientific thread running through it about, about, how, about the life cycle, the explanation of the life cycle, and how um, the bilby um, and the bilby grows and, and kind of goes out on its own. So you've got the young bilby kind of growing up in the burrow and then going out for the first time, and then he has to meet his predators to combat them, and it talks about his defensive strategies, um, but it also talks about the experiences he has from an from emotional perspective, the fears and that kind of thing. And then it talks about, obviously, the information about how bilbies have their burrow system. And then finally, the young bilby goes out into... Um, goes out into the world on his own and leaves the mother, and the life cycle um, starts again. All right, I think, sorry we've overrun. Um, I think that pretty much um, covers most of the text. So I hope that you've um, found this afternoon um, 
if anything, entertaining and, and inspiring in terms of just getting hold of those texts that hopefully you've got in your library now and just getting, getting them straight in the classroom and using them with some of the things you're already doing. And also for thinking about, um, about your planning and programming for next year, if there's any units you're going to be planning with, with the new Australian curricula, how you can interweave some of those themes and, and use these texts um, from the perspective of the Australian English curriculum. So is there, are there any questions from anyone before we go? Bit of feedback there. Thanks, thanks, guys. Glad you found some of the ideas useful. Um, like I say, you know, it's probably a good idea if you head into your library and pick up these books and have a little flick through as well, because it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult media to to kind of convey some of some of the, the richness and beauty of these texts um, just online there. All right. Looks like no one's got any questions. I will. Um, Say good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for attending and for giving up your time. And um, good luck. I hope you enjoy using these wonderful books in your classroom. Bye-bye.